thanks for uh, having me here to the uh, Ruby Ocean team. I was at uh, last year's conference, and it's a great conference, so I'm happy to be here. Um, so this is yet another how to write better code type of talk. Um, we're always helping each other out. Uh, I assume everyone here knows the topic based on the schedule. Um, I'm not gonna cover all of Reactive Cocoa, that'd be way too hard in a half an hour, but hopefully this will help people get started. Or at least give something to frame your learning going forward. So we're gonna dive right in. We're gonna look at some code. So, what I'm gonna do here is just throw some code up on screen that shows how you might, uh, using Reactive Cocoa, go um, touch an image, touch a button that uh, is to take a picture or select a picture from your photo album and uh, process it with a filter maybe, upload it to an API, and then update your uh, UI with the table view to show the new image in like a messaging app, for example. So we've got some photo button somewhere, and then we've got this awesomely named method. So just think of this rack as a stop word, just ignore it. It's uh, in you know, Objective-C, prefixing is pretty common. Um, but the main part there is signal for control events. So normally when you want to react to uh, something that a button does, uh, or an act, tap on the button, you would register using target action. Here we're creating something called a signal, and we're going to work with that. What's a signal? For now, just think of it as a real-time array. So it's just something that keeps going. Uh, we're going to map on it, just like we would with an array. Um, I apologize for using the exclamation point. That's kind of... Uh, it's not actually like what you would use bang for in Ruby, but it's kind of a necessity because in Reactive Coco, the map method takes an explicit block parameter, not the implicit one that we use in Ruby. So this allows us to not use uh, a lambda syntax, give us the more normal syntax. So we've got the button tap. That passes along an event. We map the event into an action sheet. So we create the action sheet with some you know, title and uh, two options, select select from the camera, like take a picture from the camera or select from your photo album. Do next, this is like uh, each basically, and you could do an alias if you want. Um, so we map it, now for each one we're going to show it. Now we're, here's where we get into some, a uh, little bit more complicated um, reactive code. So we have an action sheet, that action sheet would normally use a delegate. Uh, here we have a signal that sends values, just like the button tap did up above, uh, whenever you select one of the items on the action sheet. It's just going to send the index of the button you clicked. So the next line is ignore, and we're gonna ignore the button that's at the cancel index. Finally, we're going to map that from the button index to a source type. So uh, we're going to be using an image picker controller and the image picker controller has a source type. I'm really sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Can you give me like a two sentence explanation of what React Coco is? Yeah, I'm gonna get into that. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So this is my uh, awesome attempt at doing like the cold opening in a movie where you just like get into the action and then you do the, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we'll get there, I promise. Yes. Um, so yeah, so we, um, we take a, the button click signal, we ignore the cancel button because we don't want to do anything when they cancel, and then we map that to a, uh, an image type for the image picker, whether it's from the camera uh, or from the photo roll. Now, what we've done here is we've mapped a, some object into a signal. This is a signal, signal, signal. It's compositional. Um, uh, like it's closed in the mathematical sense. Everything here is, is returning a signal. So now we have Instead of uh, a signal of action sheets at the end here, we have a signal of signals. We don't want that, so we throw in a flat. We'll get into flat in a little bit more. So now we map the source type into an image picker. Pretty straightforward. Now, we have an image picker. We want to show the image picker. We want to get the selected image from the image picker, and then dismiss it. So concat is to sequence things in order. So we present it, once it's presented, we start getting the, uh, like basically waiting for a selected image. I've got take last on the end. Um, that allows the image picker to stay open if you're selecting from the uh, camera roll um, and maybe mistakenly press 
press one and not the other. Anyway, so that's sequencing. Again, we're mapping to a signal. So we flatten. Now we have the image info that comes back from that signal, which is just the dictionary. So we get out the image, and now let's just assume we've got some variable somewhere that's a filter. We're going to apply that, uh, that filter to the image, like Instagram, and um, that, this thing can take time. Uh, filtering an image, we don't want to wait on the main thread while it does that. So that's a signal, and we're going to subscribe on, and that rack scheduler thing is basically just like a, a dispatch queue. So we're creating a background dispatch queue, and you can set different priorities, um, and so this work will get done on a background queue. Now here, instead of flatten, we do concat. And that's, we saw cat, concat used up above. Same thing here. We don't want to do this, we want to do it in order, so one at a time. Um, now that our work is done, we process the image, and um, we now want to go back to the main thread. So there's, there was a, oh, I went two slides forward. Oh, so basically, now that the, uh, we've filtered the image, we're going to use our API to upload the image. This is also asynchronous. We also want this to happen one at a time. We don't want messages, photo messages, to be sent out of order so we can edit. Okay. Finally, we're done, and we want to update the user interface. So deliver on is the opposite of subscribe on, and that basically allows us to put the result into the, on, deliver it on the main thread. The most important piece here to notice here is this subscribe next block. Everything we did before was late. Nothing actually happened. We were setting things up. It's almost like there's compile time and there's runtime. This is signal setup time, if you will. So nothing happens until something wants it to happen. So you have to subscribe. Once we subscribe, we open up the gates and button taps go through, <coughs> action sheets go through, image pickers, and all the way down. So we have a message, an um, we have an image, uh, that should be image, not image info. We we create an image message, we apply it to our array that we've got kicking around, and we insert it at the, uh, at the index path that we want to have. So, the reason for going through this way is I wanted to sort of give you a sense of how React Cocoa works, where things go sort of in a top-down, compositional manner, and it's almost like writing, you know, Ruby command line scripts. Everything can read top-down, you don't have to worry about um, setting up Target action callbacks or delegate callbacks, and see where you know where the code goes elsewhere. So you might not do it exactly like this. You might use you know you'll still use functions and methods and other objects to do things. But for control flow, for data flow, for uh, interaction flow, that's where Reactive Cocoa can shine. Uh, so now we get to the title: Reactive Ruby Motion. Um, I'm Dave Lee. I'm a Reactive Cocoa contributor. And on GitHub and Twitter, my username is Castellioni. So just to sort of review what we talked about there, if you say composition in object-oriented programming, it's usually some object has some other object in it. You know, it calls through to it and takes values back. So this is kind of just, you know, like a rough idea where you've got, you know, objects that pass things around and do different things. But there's no clear start and end um, things are just sort of like this, this piece of, of stuff. And you can do it nicely, but in React with Coco, we compose this way. Um, each of these represents some sort of like a computation. Do this, do that, do that. Computations don't have to be linear, they can, you can have two items feed into one thing. Um, so the philosophy on this talk, and I gave some examples. Uh, Reactive Coke is pretty big, so I'm going to keep the scope pretty narrow. I'm going to try to keep it familiar so everybody understands Reactive Coco, because there's a lot of terminology with Reactive Coco that can be stumbling blocks to learning. I know it myself. Um, if you go to the GitHub repo and read the README and read some of the documentation, there's this laundry list of things you kind of need to know, and it's, it's not easy to read it all. Um, and so, yeah, I want to try to address some, some of the common areas where people have hurdles when they're learning React. 
So when people try to teach reactive cocoa, there's often like narratives like, you know, like uh, mutable state and, and other things. I'm not going to really do narratives. Um, there's functional programming. I'm not going to talk about functional programming. And uh, sometimes people say, oh, you really should do it this way. I'm just going to show you and hope it catches some people's interest and those who are interested, hope they uh, feel better about it after this talk. So I mentioned there's a lot of things in reactive cocoa. We're not going to use those. We're just going to talk about one rack signal. Um, so, as I've been alluding to in these previous slides, there's a lot of terminology in reactive cocoa. Not only are there those classes, but there's a lot of operators, things you do to signals. Um, don't get caught up on it. I think cocoa has a way bigger vocabulary than reactive cocoa. To be a cocoa developer um, and use Apple's documentation, you need to know more concepts. So. Okay, so um, we're going to figure out signals by refactoring callbacks. So let's take a look at the types of callbacks we do in Ruby and in Objective-C. There's blocks, there's what I call an object string, which could be a target action, could be KBO, could be notifications. You give some string or some selector and say, tell me when this thing happened on this object. Delegates, kind of similar, but there's an API involved. And even subclass, right? Like the subclass UI view to get told when uh, the view has certain life cycle events. Um, callbacks can have different purposes. You can iterate over them, uh, just like mapping or you know, doing anything on the way. There's asynchronous re results. Sometimes an API is going to take some time. It's going to do something that you don't want to wait around for. Maybe you want the result of it value, maybe you just want to know what it's done so you can order things appropriately. Um, errors. Callbacks can be used for errors as well. Uh, events. So another callback is, hey, this thing happened. It's not, there's not really a value, it's more of a semantic, uh, you know, touch happened, the uh, app changed state, uh, that kind of thing. So here's an example of, you know, sort of a hypothetical callback on, you know, a networking client. You say you get some path with some parameters. You've got a success block, a failure block. Uh, but really, there's kind of three callbacks here because when you call this the first time, or when you call this uh, in line, it has a return value. Return value might be like null or void or whatever, but there's still three ways out of this, at this line. Into this one, into this one, and then back. It's hard to reason about that. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of ways this can go, and once you start nesting things, we all know what callback hell looks like. Uh, you know, and there's ways around it, but we, we know it's a problem. So callbacks have uh, a few different dimensions, the timing and the type. So timing is whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, and uh, the type is, might have, callback might be for values, uh, might be for errors, might be to let you know when it's done. So let's try to refactor to a brand unified callback. So there's this quote, some of you might have known it, uh, all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so conversion. So instead of all the callbacks we do, you sort of pass something in. You say, here's my object, here's a string or a selector, here's a block. Um, so instead of passing the callback in, we're going to return a callback object to the caller. So our last uh, API call would just look like this. If you want a value, you could say callback.each. Do something when it gives you a value or more, more than one value. You know, failure, maybe you do something like that. <laughs> when it's done, something like that. And maybe you have to do something like that because you need to handle all of them. So what are the benefits to refactoring this way? Uh, consistency. It would be nice to not have to have, know all these different ways of doing the different callbacks and having to try to glue, glue them all together. Oh, sorry. Uh, responsibility. Now that we have a callback object, you know, we've maybe refactored for SRP and we can say, like, let this callback do certain things for us instead of putting that code in line into our callback method. Um, sorry for the mumbo jumbo here, dimensionally agnostic. That just means when I talk about the dimensions, whether it's async or uh, synchronous or whether it's errors or values, this callback handles all of those cases. So it doesn't really matter what you need a callback for, this covers all of them. An abstraction. Now we have signals give us an abstraction that didn't really exist before. Let's try to do something. 
Um, so obviously at this point, I have to jump into frag signal. So that callback that I described, that's what frag signal is. So instead of uh, passing in blocks, etc., you your method returns a, a rack signal. This is basically like a super return. It's, it's a return that you can do something with right away or you can wait on it. So code looks kind of the same. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with promises, so it's good to compare and contrast. Promises are typically a single value, so they're good for network requests, like fetch something and give it to me. Um, signals can have any number of values, it could be zero, one, or nine. Uh, promises are eager, signals are lazy. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that I, there was that setup that I did and nothing happened until the subscribe. So it allows you to set up a signal that doesn't do anything until you need it to do something, which might be good for optimization, um, you know, don't do work if you don't need it done. Um, it's good for repeating work. Uh, a promise isn't repeatable. Once you have a promise, it'll deliver a result and then that's it, you, you'd have to create a new promise. So in a way, signals subsume promises because you can do everything you need to do with a signal, or with a promise you can do with a signal. Um, so I've seen it said that signals are like the computation. It's kind of like you set up this thing that has some input, um, and then it does this, a bunch of computations. So um, it's sitting there waiting to do something for you, you just have to hook it up to do things. So what are some examples of signals that, you know, now that we have this concept, like, where are they in our apps? Oops. Um, so lifecycle events. We, we have UI application events that we want to monitor. Uh, we have view controller events that we want to monitor. These things are all signals. Uh, touch events, of course. Uh, human input, I guess that's touch events as well. Uh, Sensors, so your GPS signal, um, anything that's a, on the device that measures something or can do that, those are signals. Uh, file I.O., just getting network requests. Who does file I.O., right? Uh, so now we'll look at operators. Operators are a key part to the signals refactoring we did. Without operators, it would kind of be a useless refactoring. It's like, okay, that's nice. So. I like to think of the keyword or operators as keywords. So we all know Ruby has its keywords, and Ruby has operators, and Ruby has you know standard functions that more or less are keywords, um, <coughs> part of the standard library. So look at operators as being keywords. So don't judge them on their name because they're just kind of we don't judge uh, keywords on their name. They're just part of the part of the bundle. So with these operators, some signals. You know, they're like programmers. Sometimes we like to work alone, sometimes we work together. Signal operators do the same thing. Some of them are just to operate on a signal by itself. Some of them combine signals together. So we all know map. Filter on signal is the same as reject in Ruby. Uh, ignore is kind of the same thing. Uh, you can take, it's like, you know, um, dividing up your signal line. I just want the first thing, or I want the last thing, or I want to skip some, a few. Distinct until change. That's kind of a neat operator. Oftentimes on a callback, it's like, oh, we have the save value from the last one. Is the new one the same? If it is, well, we don't want to do anything. So you can kind of see that there. Instead of having this code inside of your callback and doing this everywhere that you need this kind of behavior, you apply this operator. So it's a little bit more declarative. There's scheduling operators. Maybe you only want you know, like GPS updates, maybe you only want them every so often, so you throttle them. Um, uh, delays, maybe you, you know, you don't want this to happen right away. Deliver on, that's dispatch async kind of thing. Time out, maybe I want this to know if this thing doesn't finish within a minute or a second or some period of time. So I talk about combination operators. If you have two signals, you can combine them. Zipping them is like, so combine latest will take, as soon as either one, like if you have two signals, Combined latest will send a new value with a pair whenever either one of them changes. Zip will send a pair when both change in lockstep. So you can model your behavior that way. Concat, we saw earlier, that's sequencing operators together. Uh, 
One thing, nice thing that I haven't talked about here and didn't go over in the code, but whenever there's an error at any step in that sequence of comp compose operators, that aborts everything. So instead of having to do your error checking where it's like some method takes an error pointer, okay, now I check to see if it does anything, if so, maybe I return early, and then I do my next step that might also have an error. Uh, errors immediately propagate out and all the rest of the work isn't done. Um, but we have operators that allow you to work with those. Side effect operators, it's nice to explicitly say, hey, I'm doing something outside of this computation. I'm not passing values along. I just want to say when certain things happen that I do this other code. Um, when you're learning, this is good to know, you can have uh, signals log things uh, as they happen. So as Ruby developers, everyone here should be probably pretty familiar with um, immutable versus mutable types, or, or uh, instances, I guess. So signals have an immutable interface. Obviously things change inside, but from the outside, once you create a signal, it doesn't change. Um, so all these operators are like map in that they return a new instance of a signal and they don't modify the original one. So it's kind of, it was, I was a bit of a jerk earlier to put exclamation points on everything because it doesn't work like that, but it was for syntactic friendliness. So one of the stumbling blocks that people uh, face when learning reactive cocoa is they're going to be seeing signals of signals. So instead of like a signal of a value, like um, you know an event or some the current user or whatever, sometimes you have signals of signals. And we saw that when I was throwing in those flattens and concats earlier. The reason is because um, you know when you do some work. Like a signal represents some work, a computation, it's going to lead into more work. And that work you might also want to uh, structure as a signal. Um, I'll get into some examples, because right now it's probably kind of big. But essentially, the longer you go, signals will be everywhere. You'll start to see them. And these uh, operators that I'm going to show, they're for arranging and sequencing when you've got signals of signals. So we talked about flatten before. Flatten is basically everything's in time. So if we had a signal of signals, that gray thing, and inside there was some signals being sent on it, by flattening it, we just get them in order, natural order of time. An example of where you might want to flatten is, let's say you've got a chat room app. You know, there's a bunch of, there's a signal called members that sends a new user every time a user uh, a user joins the chat room. Well, that user is going to send messages to the chat room. So that message is there as a signal. So we've mapped the users into, a signal of users into a signal of message signals. But we, want, we just want messages, so we flatten. Uh, concat is the second type of, of uh, signal of signal operator. And this one's you know, fairly logical. It just puts things in order of the signal as they come in. So the first signal was A, so all of its values go first. And only then does B get subscribed to it and B work finally C. Mm -hmm. So look at that a little bit differently. We can see here that, you know, in a different animation that things go all of A and all of B and then all of C. Where you would use concat might be uh, in, a, in a multiplayer game, maybe they're, each one gets some number of actions, but when it's your turn, your actions should all come first. Then it's the next player's turn. So we've got a signal of players. For each player, we're going to get their turn actions, and we're going to concatenate them, because you don't want people going out of order. Switch to latest. This one isn't used as much. It's often used for network requests. Uh, Basically, it's like this, as soon as another signal comes along, it cancels the signal preceding it. So A got to send a value, but then B came along, which canceled the rest of A and allowed B to do its thing. And finally C came along, which canceled B and allowed it to do its thing. <laughs> An example of this might be streaming music, right? You've got a music player, uh, you're on a playlist, and the user hits the next button. So you don't want, you want the previous signal for the streaming media to be cancelled because you don't want to hear two 
two things going on at the same time. And you also don't want to let the previous song finish. Um, so there's this flat map in, in React and Coco. It's kind of gets special treatment, but basically it's just the equivalent of map and fl uh, followed by flat. So all the maps and flattens I use at the beginning, um, they could all be replaced by flat and map. It's, it's sort of special for historical reasons, um, but a lot of people get hung up on it. The signals of signals is kind of confusing, but also um, the name is so generic and it kind of seems out of order. So I just wanted to make a special point of it that this is kind of like the rebase of React and Coco. You're, you know, you're going to have to get your feet wet, wet with it before you can really sort of understand it because the name just doesn't tell enough. Okay, so that's the end. Um, so my advice for learning. Uh, I learned through being uh, pretty regular on the GitHub repo. Uh, everyone who's involved in React Coco is pretty amazing at helping each other out. So if you want to learn, please do ask questions on the GitHub repo. Stack Overflow usually gets, um, gets answered there too. Uh, we, we watch there to answer people as well. Um, so, um, language development. So I think uh, whether it's promises, signals, whatever, I think we're going to start to see things like this more going forward. Um, so just sort of be aware because I think things are changing. Uh, there's a React to Coco 3. Feel free to get started with it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, it's simplifying a lot of things and it's API compatible, but it's also still in development. So it's uh, the current version of React Coco 2, by the way. Um, so next Tuesday, if you're interested, at GitHub's offices, they're doing a, a Rack developer meetup. Uh, starts at 10 or 11, and so people on the core team are going to be speaking about React and Coco. And then there's going to be a Q&A panel. So if you want to ask questions and learn more, um, if you've got your own, you know, things that you faced and you want <coughs> answering them, come, come there and you'll learn more. Uh, for the reading, I won't go over these. Um, but these are probably the ones that I thought were best. I will point out here that uh, this one's about promises, but I love reading it. I thought about two thirds of it all applied to React and Coco. Um, so it's an interesting read. And uh, one of the people active in the React and, community, uh, React and Coco community, Bob Sprint's got something he's working on, but it's a really good read, but he's not done yet. So. Um, and just thanks to some of the React Coco people and some friends and family that helped me out with the slides.